Olá, pessoal. Muito boa tarde. Hoje é dia 15 de outubro e nós estamos começando uma série de diálogos aqui sobre uh, aquilo que o Google promoveu em São Paulo, um evento chamado Think with Google. E, em especial, esse evento vai ser totalmente em inglês porque a gente tem convidados aqui que, bom, que falam inglês. Então, nós vamos bater um papo com eles. Vocês estão participando dessa gravação ao vivo. Estamos transmitindo através do YouTube Live. E sejam bem-vindos, então. Eu tenho um convidado aqui comigo, que é o Tiago, que vai fazer a introdução e a apresentação dos nossos convidados, né, Tiago? Exatamente. So, from now, we go in English. A little bit in Portuguese, just to Ok, a little with. bit in Portuguese. So, Isso. Uh, bom, obrigado pelo convite, por estar aqui com vocês. Uh, a gente hoje inaugura, então, a série que é o Think, uh, que acompanha os eventos Think que o Google... Uh, desenvolveu há cerca de um mês no Brasil, para muito focado em cada uma das indústrias, com olhar do que é o futuro e do que vem pela frente. Uh, hoje a gente começa uma sequência que é para manter essa conversa viva, a gente começa uma sequência hoje de Finks, uh, no caso Hangouts, né, sobre os eventos Fink, e aí eu tenho o prazer de começar isso falando da indústria de turismo, que é a indústria, uma das indústrias uh, que eu lidero no Google Brasil. Uh, então, para isso, como já adiantamos aqui, temos dois convidados. A partir de agora, eu passo uh, para o inglês para que a gente já comece essa conversa, esse bate-papo com eles, tá? Great. Let's go. All right. So, yeah. introducing my two, uh, my two colleagues here who are in this hangout with me, we have Jane Butler, which, who works uh, for Google, and she is now in California, in Mountain View. Hi, Jane. Hi, nice to see you again, Jago. Nice to see you again. She was here... Uh, for the Think event, she, she did an amazing presentation. She's uh, uh, now the global director for vertical search and very experienced on the travel business. And we have also Gerd Leonard. Hi, Gerd. Hello there. Good to see you again. He's the fut futurist and CEO of the Futures Agency. And we had a pleasure to have him here also at that uh, time in August. And now we are, we, we are facing uh, each other here on, on the Hangout on Air. It's a very good opportunity to keep the conversation that you guys and myself started uh, a couple of months ago. So I would like to kick off here our, our chat by asking to Gerd, uh, which is uh, what I think a good warm-up question. Uh, based on what you spoke here uh, in, in Sao Paulo, Gerd, uh, you said that we should feel uh, the future, right, during, during your speech. So I would like to, to tell us uh, now, in your opinion, what is the best way for us to do that, uh, to make it tangible, to, to, to feel the future on our daily routine. Yeah, I think that the, um, you know, the concept of thinking about the future is, is a very good start. But in the end, what it comes down to is, is that we, we, uh, there's quite a few things that we can see today that we know will be true in, in just three to five years. Just like 10 years ago, we knew that music was going to be in the cloud, you know, Spotify or so, and, and nobody really wanted it to be in the cloud, but now it is. So if we, if we look 10 years into the future and then go backwards, it's really more about getting a feel for the future and accepting what happens or developing a sort of an intuition, you know, what I call foresights. And I think a lot of foresights are, are not exactly like left brain, you know, I'm not running a spreadsheet to figure out my future. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm basically, uh, I, I need to be a little bit more intuitive and consider a few other things around the facts. And this is why I think it's important to feel the future rather than just think it. Right, perfect. I mean, uh, that's, that's a good uh, start. And I'd like to, to hear, uh, Jane, of what's your opinion towards on the, the travel experience. What, what is, mm -hmm. your, in your point of view, uh, the tools or the experiences online that uh, the, the traveler or the user can, can uh, touch or feel this future in his hands nowadays? regards to the travel experience? Well, I think so much of it is going mobile and, um, you know, going on the road with you. So it's not about just, it is now a digital experience from the time that you're planning your trip or researching your trip all the way through physically getting on the plane or in the car or checking into your hotel. So you can already see things through the form of, uh, clearly the booking part of it is already happening online and has been doing so for years that increasingly it's things like your mobile device as your boarding pass or as your room key, which is increasingly starting to happen. In fact, I think in Switzerland, they, there was, um, that was happening even a few years ago in a few hotels. So there is, um, so the mobile device becoming your, per, your, your constant companion um, to not only book and experience your travel, but to research things that you can do while you're online. So I think that's probably 
the the most um, the most tangible part of the future that we're going to start to see further explode in in top, uh, in, in both popularity and potential um, in, in not only the coming years but the coming months. Things are happening so quickly, especially in the mobile frontier. Do, do you mind? I'm 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 very curious about this uh, conversation because uh, both both of them, they they seems to see the future, right? Uh, how how do you do that? Can, can you explain how do you how do you see the future? I, I'm I'm looking at the girl. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you, you you seems to be a futurist. How, how do, do you live in the future or how how do you Are see we the, in the future? Past now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you say no, something? I, you know, I, I, I think it's really, really quite simple. I focus on the things that are one step beyond the obvious. And I think if you're in business today, you always have to go at least one or two steps beyond the obvious because the speed is mind boggling. I mean, if you're looking at, at like Google Field Trip today, you know, the, the app that shows mm -hmm. you what's around you, and you're thinking of that five years into the future, it's not too far fetched to, to imagine that this becomes the, you know, what Marshall McLuhan called the extension of man. You know, the the external brain. So with a little bit of imagination and fantasy and observing, you can sort of safely anticipate things that are in the sort of range of five years, not 20 years or 50 years. You know, that probably takes more of a scientist. But um, I mean, the stuff that's already here today, it's, it's fairly obvious if you take your time to look. So the problem that I see with many of my clients, you know, large companies and, and people who are, you know, quite busy, is that they're always chasing next week's revenue. And therefore, some of them mm -hmm. may not have next year's revenue. Uh, because, you know, this is sort of the short-term short thinking that is in the way of us understanding the future. It's incredible. Yes, I know it's not it's not a very popular sport in, in Brazil, but I'm married to a Canadian, so um, everything for us is, is in metaphors around ice hockey. And so Wayne Gretzky, who is, they call him the great one, yeah. um, his famous quote was, skate to where the puck is going. So it, it, it very much speaks to what Gerd was talking about, but the, the idea that you can't just be looking down at your feet about where the where the puck or the or the football is today, you have to think about where where it's going, and then try to figure out how you're going to intercept that pass or be ready for it. And living, especially being here on main campus for Google, you see how the, our engineers and product people are really thinking about how those applications can come to life. And it's it's a relatively practical point of view. It's just if we want to be able to do this simpler, easier, faster. And we break away from today's confines. How might that look? And we're blessed with the resources to help play and invest in a lot of those technologies and really play things out. And Google Glass, which is incorporating this field trip, which is like having a, a tour guide on your shoulder, um, be able to speak to you as you look around the room or look around the, um, the museum or out on a hiking trail and be able to tell you what you're looking at is is kind of bringing that that wish to life using some fun technology. So it's, it's a very inspiring place to walk around this campus. Fantastic. And, and how do you see, how do you both uh, see companies, not of course the technology ones or the uh, Google likes companies, uh, but the travel ones, how do you see those companies uh, following uh, the user on this experience or more than that, building up the pathway to, to make it tangible, I mean, to to bring the future closer to, to the days of today. Mm -hmm. Well, do you have any example to mention about, I mean, any, any, any travel company which is uh, uh, foreseeing this and implementing things on a more fast way so that we can, we as users or consumers can, can, can uh, use their tools or can, can have the uh, more tangible experience of uh, good initiatives on that? Yeah, I, I think yeah, some of you may know this new book by Rita McGrath, who is a strategist professor, uh, talking about strategy. Uh, and I, uh, I think her name is Rita Gunter McGrath. And it, it's talking about basically how this whole idea of sustainable advantage is going away, and it's being replaced by what she calls a transient advantage, which means taking advantage of a, of a window and then hopping onto the next window rather than constantly you know, fixing the current window. <laughs> and this is a very interesting scenario. So I, I see travel companies, for example, looking at this and saying, you know, how can, we, how can we create something that's going to be true for the next five years or 10 years? And, and this is kind of looking backwards. It's like you go 240 miles an hour and you look in the rear mirror the whole time. And, uh, and of course, you'll have an accident. 
right? So, so looking forward today means because of the exponential speed of technology, it, it, it means using imagination uh, and using this sort of uh, uh, you know one step beyond kind of thinking. And I think there's companies, for example, in uh, credit card companies who are now saying that credit cards, as we know it, will go away, and now we're going to have the smart, the connected credit card, right? There's uh, one company in particular, I, I'll think of it in a second, what they're called, uh, CardSpring, I think it's what they're called, um, where the card connects to like apps that you can download onto the card. And so they're thinking of the card as a platform, not just as a card. And this is really the kind of thing where that Rita McGrath calls this the arena thinking. So we're thinking about the whole arena of travel and, uh, 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 and the services, not just about the industry, but about the whole arena around it. You know, because most of the change, change will come from people outside of the current business, you know, innovators who are not actually mm -hmm. travel companies yet. Yeah, I, I would concur with that. Um, my observation so far that traditional travel companies are still having a hard time adapting to the new realities. They, uh, they are frequently built, their technology is frequently built off of old systems, so they're having a hard time just adapting their systems to um, to the, the speed and the pace of expectation on the part of the users. Um, I think there's a lot of desire and acknowledgement that this is where things are heading, but they, they feel a little handicapped or um, slow in being able to adapt. And what you see is essentially traditional companies um, are, are making incremental changes and new companies are coming in and just redefining how things should look. So if you look at any of the online Travel agencies is, is one starting point. They have clearly rewritten how that has looked, and now the, the traditional players are starting to catch up. Uh, one of my favorite examples in the travel space is Airbnb, because they just created a whole new model, and their experience is beautiful. It's simple. It just works. They have they kind of they don't have all the baggage that comes with a lot of um, longer-standing brands, and so it's really about breaking apart from your old thinking and if you were to start your company today, how would you operate, how would you look, what would your product be like versus thinking in these very incremental steps. Um, now, now that's very daunting, but in terms of if, if you really want to rethink your product to the way it should and your, your experience and your engagement with your customers, you, you do need to take on a really fresh take to be able to keep up. Otherwise, you'll just kind of um, putter along pretty slowly. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, you know, uh, interesting, here in Europe, for example, when I do sessions with uh, tourist organizations or hotel groups or, or airlines, right, I, I often say, you know, there's two things you should, you should do. One is you spend the next two or three or four weeks, if you can, doing everything that you do otherwise only with a mobile phone. And that's mm -hmm. what you, when you discover what the future is, because that's what everybody's doing. And, and that's what the kids are doing, and that's what your future clients are doing, and that's how people are going to buy stuff. You know, 80, 90 percent of internet traffic will be mobile, and it will, it will not be called computing in that sense anymore. Right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a gesture, the touch screen, the location. You know, this this extreme way of using the mobile as a second brain, which which has some issues, of course. But at the same time, you learn about how people are actually doing this rather than what you want them to do. Uh, and the second thing is that you have to forget about this idea of having an information advantage you know, what's called uh, information disparity, that you as a company know more about uh, whatever that, that you're doing than your client, which is just no longer true. I mean, I can find out anything as a customer, and I can, I can know more about my, you know, problem when I go to the doctor than a doctor who's 65 years, years old and never used the Internet before. Right? Mm -hmm. So information disparity is dead. I mean, you, you don't have an information advantage. You, have a, a, you, you may have a wisdom advantage, hopefully, <laughs> as a company, but an information advantage is, is evaporating. So if you if you rely on that for your business, then you're just going to be the next record labels, basically. I think another angle to that is around the user focus, because I think so often companies, they, they can't get out of their own box, right? They just keep thinking about their own business models, their own challenges with IT and so forth, and the poor customer is the one that is is the last on the list in terms of their priorities and the consideration. And I think that's something that, that has helped us move quickly at Google is that we are constantly focused on the user, the user needs, how do we best serve the user, and then we kind of work backwards from there. And it's, and it's not something, you know, we haven't trademarked focus on the user. It, it should be something that everyone adopts. And I think to your point, Jared, if you walk around with your mobile phone and you're thinking and acting like a user, it will dramatically change how you think about your business, how to simplify and focus, 
Um, but but there's, I, I know I mentioned in my my speech when I was in Sao Paulo about um, there's the the World Economic Forum is working on this project called Connected Worlds. Sorry, the light that just went out. In the, it's motion activated, so I'm doing exercises here. There you, go. you have to um, jump up and down. So the uh, <laughs> yeah exactly. Uh, so so they um, they have a, a group of folks who are from from dozens of global companies across transportation, travel, IT, all trying to get together and talk about what the future of travel is like. And I was sat in on I was just in a New York meeting where they they had all these task force um, companies represented for the task force, and we were talking about the the future of an integrated, proactive intermodal travel assistant. And everyone agreed this is where things are going. And so few of the companies were willing to engage on how to make that possible because they were all protecting their own turfs about, well, I don't, you know, this is my data and I don't want to engage this way. And I don't, and, and I think we as Google are able to let go a lot of the um, kind of traditional business model constraints and think a bit more freely. And so, my point was, we're going to kind of keep doing these things, and if you guys would like to join on, you know, come along. We'll we'll have fun if you if you want to play. But there's there was a lot of um, kind of swirling around. I just don't think that we would be willing to make that jump. And I I think the more pervasive that thinking, um, the farther behind, you know, a company will get left. You know, they mentioned uh, you you guys mentioned uh, about cell phones. And I'm curious about it because I, Thiago and I we live in, we live in a country that has more cell phones than people, right? Yes. I think we have two cells for per more or per, less. You know, I don't know. Well, in a country like this that we have more cell phones uh, than people, what kind of uh, competitive advantage you think that we can do or can make or can have? Foster, yes. Yeah. I would like to link your question to another thought uh, because of just what uh, Jane and Gerd said, uh, just said. Uh, in regards to the travel experience, if you could split in five parts, as five, four or five parts as, as Jane used to use this kind of matrix in the past, which is first you have the researching and dreaming, then you have the, or for, sorry, first you have the dreaming, then you have the research slash uh, planning, then you have the purchase, and then experience uh, the, 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 the trip itself or the, the travel experience itself and after that uh, sharing. Uh, bring the mobile uh, perspective in, into this and uh, the innovative approach. In which of these uh, uh, steps would you consider that uh, the travel companies are less innovative? <laughs> well, maybe you should phrase the question and say which ones are not. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, <laughs> well, uh, Jane, you want to you want to go first on this, or? I think there's probably been more focus on the actual experiencing part of things right now. So people recognize that this is a good you know airlines move quickly with the mobile boarding passes. So that's once you're actually already on on your trip and about to go through the airport. I think there's been greater recognition of. Um, being able to use the mobile device for finding activities, looking at reviews, and, and that kind of thing once you're once you're traveling, but there's been a lot of slowness and trepidation on mobile commerce, although it's growing quickly. I don't think the industry has moved fast enough to to rise to the consumer expectation, and we have launched some things with our our Google Wallet to be able to help facilitate that in working with partners. So we hope that that will remove some of the friction in e-commerce that exists today. But I, I think that will be probably the next big big pop is a recognition that people do want to book on their mobile phones and that the industry needs to, to keep up with it. And then I think it will continue to add on from there. You know, I, I think that uh, I think the bottom line with most of these issues comes down to what I experienced when I worked in the music business for 10 uh, last years. No, uh, 10 last years, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no, but when, I, when, when I worked in the music business, you know, it comes down to one big item, and that is control. Right? So if you are looking to retain control because of your information advantage, or you don't want to be transparent on pricing, or you're looking to hide something that just isn't quite there, or you're trying to keep something back from the cons from the customer that he may find out that that he has an advantage on, mm -hmm. you know, you're looking to essentially create some sort of control situation 
we, we you want to have the cake and you want to eat it at the same time, right? Uh, and that's of course very true for for large companies. You, <laughs> you know, this is nothing wrong yeah. with that. But what I'm saying is like I think ultimately yeah. what it comes down to, when the consumer realizes that that this is the game, and 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 it's sort of like a Faustian bargain. You know, they they trust people that they work with, and then it turns out that it's not quite the same. You know, that becomes sort of a letdown, and then the whole relationship breaks down, and then social media is toast, and the whole thing turns into the wrong direction, right? So it's all about control and trust. And people buy stuff because they are in control, <laughs> not not us, the providers, right? And mm -hmm. they also buy stuff because they, they trust their providers. And this is really what it comes down to when you use the mobile phone. You have to give them that control and, and not try to get back through it to the back door. So what I call, you know, the, the uh, basically trying to create a mouse trap after you create an opening. So it's, uh, and, and this is a very common problem, for example, with airlines, you know, because clearly the information advantage is, it means real, real money in the end of the day. So there has to be a balance between the give and take, you know, between the open and the closed uh, uh, to create a fruitful situation. But it's, it's going to be very hard, I think, to retain your, your advantage over the consumer while at the same time trying to build a relationship with them. Uh, and, and this is really what, what the whole social local mobile comes down to. You're building a relationship and therefore it's much more uh, important to engage than to encage, as I call it, you know, to, to put people into mm -hmm. a cage. Mm -hmm. Bringing this, this context and also uh, based on the experience that you guys had personally when you came to Brazil a couple of months ago, uh, what would be your most important advice to Brazilian companies uh, looking for the World Cup and other big events that we are hosting in a couple of next years? Meaning, mm -hmm. uh, and I really like to to have it like a personal approach on this on this answer because you guys just came down here, you faced what it is, the whole experience of traveling to Brazil mm -hmm. or coming to Brazil or even uh, Sao Paulo, which is a more chaotic chaotic scenario. Uh, but what would be your, your advice on on to to Brazilian travel companies? Meaning, what what's what's the opportunity that you guys uh, uh, faced uh, towards or or take into consideration your travel experience to Brazil? Well, I, I know just starting at the very beginning, um, the visa process was something that <laughs> was kind of new for me, at least for the, for the U.S. side of things. And that that was, um, that was takes a lot of planning. And so even to be, as if you're trying to welcome visitors to Brazil to make sure that they are well informed and feel like you as a Brazilian uh, travel or tourism company are inviting them and making it easy for them to get through the process of not only booking their travel, but figuring out all the, the kind of bits and pieces that they need to have organized to get down there. Um, figuring out how to, to transport itself um, into the city or to the events. I was asking my taxi driver on the way out kind of where everything was because I was stuck in um, two and a half hour traffic to get to the airport. Yeah. and trying to figure out all those pieces so there, there's a lot of logistical things that the, yeah. that being able to, uh, to kind of help people navigate through that on a very basic level but the other impression I had was just is, and I've told you this Chuck I loved coming I loved the people that I met there and somehow being able to showcase that and I do remember some of the, um, the Brazilian tourism office had done a good job of reflecting the culture in their YouTube channel this was a year or two ago but I, I somehow blending um, the you know the passion of the Brazilian people and just how welcoming I um, I, I think packaging that with how making it easy and just making it work because that's the other thing that I think Brazil will probably be most challenged with is it's going to be difficult to make all these pieces work so whatever you can do to kind of simplify and smooth the rough edges I think will go a long way. Nice. Yeah, I mean I I've been to Brazil maybe dozen times or something, so I have, I mean, uh, mostly to Rio and Sao Paulo and maybe uh, below Horizon. I, I've been to uh, Porto Alegre as well. Yeah. But, um, so I have a little bit of experience there. But I think in, in f as far as uh, e-commerce and, and mobile and technology goes, the most important thing about Brazil, in my view, uh, is to uh, create an ecosystem that is uniquely Brazilian in terms of what it does and how it does it. You know, for example, um, the whole debate about what you do with people's data. You know, we have, uh, I mean, you know, we, we have a lot of issues with that in Europe, but looking at the U.S., you know, there are major issues about what happens with people's data, and of course, Google is right in the middle of this, but I think it's very important for Brazilians to figure out, you know, what's okay to do with data and what's not, 
and to not uh, yield to the temptation of abusing people's data. And this is what it's really going to come down to when you have a country of, uh, you know, what, 220 million people, you're going to need people to feel safe with what they're doing on those devices. Otherwise, they'll eventually retract, like people are starting to do in Europe and other places. Uh, and you also need to build a sustainable business, you know, so sustainable in the sense of, you know, that you don't addict people to devices, but at the same time also sustainable in terms of, you know, hotels, airlines, and what you do with the infrastructure. Clearly what's happening in Sao Paulo is not sustainable. And yeah. so, you know, the idea of everybody buying a car is, is madness, right? So I think this is very important for Brazil to find its own way forward to be sustainable, to not abuse people's data, uh, to think of a collective approach to solving problems, and not necessarily copy the things that used to work 30 years ago in America. Uh, you know, because they may have worked back then, but they're not working anymore. <laughs> so yeah, so sure. I think this is crucial for Brazil to figure that out, because technology is not a, a panacea, you know, it's not going to solve all of those problems. Right. Especially when you think about the World Cup is going to attract a very international audience that that will come in with some high expectations, right? So I, I think being aware of that and thinking through kind of some simple, some priorities around what will be most important to to visitors and making that experience smooth and and um, understanding what visitors um, will come to expect, what their potential challenges and opportunities and excitement areas will be, and then being able to play to that. But it's I think it's a tremendous opportunity, but it's it's going to be a big challenge, I think, as well. So I, I bring this question for you that is here in Brazil. What's your perspective of the World Cup and Olympics? And no, I, I, I agree with them on the, on the, on the part that uh, maybe opportunities, business opportunities are on, uh, on areas that maybe the government would, would be, uh, if, he, he, if it could be doing a good job, you wouldn't have the problem with logistics or uh, transportation constraints and et cetera. And, and then it opens the door to, uh, business, to business, uh, business people to, f to maybe create a better, uh, better tools or better uh, landscape on exploring this kind of uh, constraints, constraints of uh, resources constraints. So uh, my perspective is that uh, there is, uh, there's, uh, well, even, even being Brazilian is, is complicated sometimes to, fr to go from here to there or to travel uh, in, the, in the countryside of Brazil. So every time I'm, I'm, I'm traveling, I try to, to understand what would be a foreigner perspective of uh, the, the same travel experience that I'm having as a Brazilian because somehow uh, there are some, some cases that we struggle a lot to find either where to go or uh, where is a good place to go and et cetera. So my perspective is that uh, maybe the foreigners are going to struggle a little bit when they come down here. Mm -hmm. But as, as Jane mentioned, we have this very good spirit of uh, hospitality or, or of being uh, opening, open, opening ourselves to foreigners and to, to receive people in a very good manner here in Brazil. So uh, at the end of the day, people compensate the lack of uh, infrastructure. But I understand that also this is not a professional way of looking at, into things. We don't have to have this amateur approach as we've been having. But uh, at the end of, again, uh, unfortunately, we, we count on, on much more on private and, uh, and private initiatives to, to kind of uh, uh, close the gap than government ones. Well. Well, but, but at least you have the J. Ginio, right? What was it called? J. J. Ginio? You have that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. Ginio Ginio. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Ginio yeah. Genius. Yeah, that's make, right. make stuff up, you know, improvise. <laughs> <laughs> we are talking about future, Gerd, not past, man. We are talking about future. <laughs> well, I, I wish that's that was old. a future. Here in Switzerland, we never had that. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so we can talk about Star Trek, maybe teletransportation, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I had a question for you, but we we're, we don't have much time here. But uh, I I was at TED conference uh -huh. uh, maybe two years ago, and uh, I saw there a, a Google presentation about the Google car. It was a self-driven oh, car, yeah. right? I was very impressed about that thing. It was it was an amazing thing for me, and. Uh, just a couple of months after that, I, I, I read in a newspaper, in an American mm -hmm. newspaper, that, that 
that there is a state in the U.S. that changed the law allowing the car to be used by normal people everywhere. I think it's Nevada. I'm not, I'm not sure, but I think it's Nevada. I think it was California. Yeah, it was California, California. right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, once I, I was impressed with the car, but yeah. with that move so fast, I think we have some restrictions here in Brazil to do that. Yeah. Changing the laws is not easy. Yeah. So to accept all this new technology, it, 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 when I saw the car, the future seems to be too far to see that car on the streets. Yeah. But just a couple of months, we are we are watching that yeah. going on, right? I agree. So I think that the good the good the good uh, part behind it is that not just changing the laws, but uh, having people prepared to understand what's what's going on outside. Definitely. Uh, you have this approach, you have the data approach that uh, Gerd just mentioned. So it's, it's having the, the infrastructure, let's put it this way, behind many legal people or, uh, you know, uh, all those, those uh, lawyers to understand what is changing and how fast it's changing right. and how to adapt fast the, the way they think uh, to have the society ready for, for the future, right? right? So I don't know how, how what, what do you have in mind about it, Jane, but... My perspective is that uh, this is crucial for uh, for the growth of the, uh, any digital business. Also, I mean, the whole infrastructure uh, on the on the legal, 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 and and polit politics and etc. behind it to to grow uh, together with with the technology. Yeah, it, it's um, it doesn't always go hand in hand. Um, I think a lot of I'm sure this is true in every country. A lot of rules and laws and legislation were written decades ago, if not longer, and they were designed for a very different different society in a different time. And there are examples when it comes to you, you never probably thought about having to allow a car that doesn't have a driver behind the wheel actually on the roads, but it's probably something that we need to think about. And I think a lot of that is a nod to Silicon Valley and being at the heart of so much innovation that they were willing to engage on that front. The other example I think about, which is which is much more basic, but um, Tesla, which is the 100% electric car that is, has been manufactured here in California, mm -hmm. um, was has gone uh, direct to users <laughs> or direct to consumers in their sales a showrooms, but they don't have dealers. And to actually set that up so that they were selling direct to consumer. And by the way, it's like going to an Apple store. You, it, a lot of it is done online. It is a completely different experience than is typical of the negotiation that you might have with the dealer representative. But here in the US, dealer franchises have been protected in laws for years and years at the state level. And so Tesla found a way in working in Washington and on the state legislation to, to if you had one dealership, then you were kind of caught under this rule of like all the dealers are protected and everyone must be able to work this way. And they kind of found their way out. But as a consumer, I much prefer to deal with a company like Tesla who, who's, who makes the experience actually pleasant to go in there and, and look at the product online or or even buying it is all like clicking off of a, of a, of a mouse pad. There's no you know, hour long negotiations with anyone in the back room. And so yeah. Again, it's designed for current day expectations, yet caught up in a lot of the, a lot of the you know red tape and, and legal rules of a bygone era. Uh -huh. So this will this will take time, um, but I think there are some innovators who speak to the consumer value proposition versus the protection of companies that may not be adding the same level of value. And I think ultimately that will win out, but it's going to take a long time. Yeah, you know, I think we're now we're entering a, a, a period of um, where the technology is now so good and so fast and so powerful and also very addictive in many cases that now it's in, invariably uh, uh, every question of technology is also an ethical question now. For example, mm -hmm. the self-driving car, the robot car, as some people call it, it cannot drive anywhere without, without having publicly available data mm -hmm. that is fed into the car at 400 megabits a second, you know, to, to even allow it to go one feet. Yeah, couldn't go, and that data has to come from somewhere. And then there's questions about, you know, what if, uh, you know, if if we have lots of these kind of cars, can a regular person still drive the same way that they want to drive, or do they have to actually consider the robot cars 
and change their way of driving. So there are ethical issues, there are cultural issues, and there are new social contracts that we're going to have to write, for example, Google Glass, uh, and eventually the brain implant, which, we're, which will be right after that, you know, we call it the I Google head or whatever. Um, we're, we're going to see uh, the challenge of figuring out how to create a social contract around these new technologies. Uh, and, and so now technologies at that point, which Ray Kurzweil calls the, the very soon the singularity, uh, how, how these issues are actually going to impact what we want to do as humans and what we should be doing rather than what we can be doing. Right? And, and so uh, we're at that point now very soon and the, the self-driving car is one of those first issues where we have to think about, okay, what should the rules be? Should people in Sao Paulo not be allowed to, to buy a car? And should they get public electric cars as a consequence? Or, you know, what, what is the right thing to do? It's a fantastic theme uh, for another, you know, hangout because sure. uh, <laughs> when you talk about ethics, yeah. you can, you know, you can spend a whole day here. That's great. I just want to clarify that there is no announcement around a uh, embedded chip in your head. Okay. That is, uh, <laughs> that, that is you're talking about it being a futurist and where where things could go. But just to confirm, there is. Uh, and I mean, clearly, now in, in technical terms, that's the next step. You know, first you type, <laughs> then you talk. Then you blink, then you think. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's, uh, and, and that is the next step. You know, uh, mm -hmm. hopefully Google will not tackle that step, um, but you know that's kind of a logical consequence. You know, as as we've seen in uh, Total Recall or whatever. <laughs> so, Minority Report. So yeah, my brand will be part of the Google search, right? <laughs> gonna gonna Google search and gun into my brand and everybody's brand. I hope you're not drunk. <laughs> you're not drunk. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably here at Villa Madalena, it's not gonna work very well. But yeah, anyway, that's for okay. sure. <laughs> okay, guys, I, I want to thank you uh, for this time, for this hangout. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and uh, I hope to see you soon. Sure, very nice talking to okay. you guys. Thank you very much. See you yes, later. Nice to okay. see you again. Thank you. Tchau, Thanks. gente. Obrigado. Tchau. Um prazer. Thank you. Thank you. Obrigado. Tchau. Tchau. Obrigado, viu? Obrigado. Valeu. Valeu cara, Foi ótimo. Obrigado. Conte right. comigo aí. Bye. Obrigado, meu caro. Obrigado a vocês que estiveram com a gente. Bom, a gente volta no próximo, acho que amanhã. Tem uma programação toda pela frente aí, né? Tá bom. Obrigado, pessoal. Um abraço para todos. Música